Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome to your weekly Linux and open source news video. This week we have Steam finally coming to Chrome OS, we've got Windows making an underwhelming debut on the Steam Deck, and we've got Ubuntu with its brand new logo that doesn't seem up to the standards of everyone. Oh, and Arch turned 20 by the way. And 20 out of 20, that's the score I'm giving to this segue to today's sponsor, which will definitely let you keep your CentOS servers for a little bit longer while you plan your migration. This video is sponsored by Toxcare, and you all know by now that CentOS 8 is end of life. It's not getting any patches for any new vulnerabilities in any of its packages. Unless you use Tuxcare's extended lifecycle support service, which basically lets you get all the security patches, but straight from Tuxcare instead of the distro. This means that your systems will stay safe and compliant with all your security requirements while you plan your migration to another OS. Now, why would you want to maintain support for an OS that just reached end of life? Why can't you just run it as is? Well, because not having support gets expensive very quickly. Tuxcare has a calculator on their website, I left a link in the description below. Check it out to see how expensive it can get to run an OS without security patches. Now, as the Log4j issues have shown, being at risk and being attacked is not something that only happens to others. It's a serious issue that needs to be addressed by all organizations. So use the link in the description to check out and subscribe to Tuxcare's extended lifecycle support services and plan your migration from CentOS 8 with a little bit more peace of mind. Okay, let's begin with Arch Linux. It celebrated its 20th birthday on March the 11th. It actually started in 2002 with its first 0.1 version, a time where Ubuntu didn't even exist as anything else than a twinkle in the eye of Mr. Shuttleworth. The main advantage at the time was the Arch build system, which is still the main advantage of Arch 20 years later. It didn't have a pretty interactive installer back then, as the creator put it in the 0.1 release notes, and while it does now have an optional installer, it's neither pretty nor interactive. Basically, that's a distro that stayed true to its roots, even though it's been growing more and more prominent through Arch-based distros like Endeavor or Manjaro, but also as the base for the very recent SteamOS 3. So let's insert here any pun containing the terms by the way and move on to the next story, which isn't about Arch by the way. Another vulnerability seems to be affecting Linux, and this time it's a security hole in NetFilter, an almost ubiquitous firewall program. This issue was found by Nick Gregory, a threat researcher at Sophos, a security firm. The vulnerability is exploitable to access the kernel and execute code in order to get local privilege escalation or even escaping a container. Basically, it's very serious. Thankfully, this vulnerability is only present from kernel versions 5.4 to 5.6.10, which aren't that recent, but might still be on a lot of servers, including some running Red Hat 8, Debian Bullseye, Ubuntu 20.04 LTS, or SUSE 15.3. The patch has already been created, but isn't yet available for all distributions. Yet another security vulnerability on Linux, fortunately these are patched extremely quickly after they've been discovered and disclosed, so yeah, we're good with that. Google announced the first alpha of Steam for Chromebooks. This thing has been dragging its feet for years at that point, but it seems that it's finally becoming a reality. It looks like the Steam client for Chrome OS is just the Linux client that runs inside of Google's Borealis Linux container. Which makes me wonder why it took so long to arrive. It's only going to be available on a few select Chromebook models to begin with, although they don't say when or on which models. While no Chromebook model has a very strong GPU, they'll definitely be able to play a few indie games, and maybe some older AAA titles in low quality. So it's definitely a win for Linux gaming as well. Lots of wins in that area recently. You've gotta love how Linux is slowly becoming a major player in the gaming market. Ubuntu is getting a new logo. The old Circle of Friends design is still there and still reminiscent of its first multicolored iteration, but it's also a lot more simple. Of course, as with all redesigns, people seem to not really enjoy how it looks, citing the giant rectangle, the lack of alignment, the fact that it doesn't look like three people holding hands anymore, or that it looks like a washing machine as reasons to diss it. 
Personally, I find it nice. It's simple, it's modern, it's recognizably the Ubuntu brand. In any case, it's just a logo, it probably won't make people use Ubuntu over anything else or drop Ubuntu for something else. Do you like it? And do you think it looks like a washing machine? Let me know in the comments, I'm actually interested to see how many people like it or not. Now, Stadia, Google's cloud gaming service, unveiled more details about their translation layer for porting Windows games to Linux. They only have three people working on their Stadia porting toolkit, and it seems like it uses DXVK to translate DirectX instructions into Vulkan instructions that Linux systems can actually act on. They said it's not production ready and that it's really something that requires work on a per game basis, instead of being an all encompassing solution like Wine or Proton. Why not use Proton? Because apparently Stadia is very thin as a platform and doesn't embark most of what Wine and Proton need to work. This definitely won't make Stadia more appealing to people who already don't like cloud gaming, but having more titles available on the platform might make it survive its announced death a little bit longer, who knows? Probably not, honestly. Zorin OS 16.1 was released, bringing a few things up to date compared to the initial release. LibreOffice is now at version 7.3, with its better dark mode and better compatibility with Microsoft Office. There's the newer 5.13 Linux kernel with the hardware enablement stack, so Zorin OS 16.1 should support newer hardware out of the box, and it also gives it full compatibility with the Framework laptop, the Magic Mouse 2 or the DualShock 5. Users of Zorin already got the update, and people who aren't on Zorin but are interested can download that ISO right now. The German government had a project to push the use of free software back when they formed a coalition a hundred days ago. Since then, unfortunately, it seems that nothing has been done to actually work on that. No budget has been defined, no plan to identify and promote these technologies had been laid out, and there is no indication of how people can get integrated into that process. Worse, it seems that the government seems open to offers from SAP, using Microsoft products, which are definitely not free software. The Free Software Foundation for Europe, or FSFE, is pushing them to actually make good on their announcement and promises, but it's really sad to see another government fall victim to the same trap over and over again, instead of finally taking the plunge, making the initial investment, moving to free software, and then just save money over the course of decades. Another week goes by and we have more KDE updates again, and this time it's to announce that one of the most reviled bugs that ever existed on KDE is now fixed. Remember these semi-transparent corners that were blurry and square when using third-party decorations for your window manager? Well, themes can and must now specify a mask graphic that will remove that area and make corners nice again. Of course, that's not all, as Kate and any Ktext editor-based program now has access to multiple cursors to write in different places at the same time. Ocular now has a welcome screen, EPUB files now display thumbnails of the actual contents of the file, and there are tons of smaller bugs being squashed, user interface improvements, and quality of life fixes. Now the question is, will we get these improvements on the desktop mode of the Steam Deck as soon as they're released, or will we have to wait for them? Flatpak and Flathub continues to gain speed, probably thanks to the Steam Deck's release, as developers realize that it's the only user-friendly way to get their apps in the hands of Deck users. So Heroic Games Launcher is now on Flathub, which means Epic Games are just a few clicks away on your handheld PC. I tested it myself and even made a video guide you can find in the card up top. It works fantastically in desktop mode and in gaming mode, and a lot of games I tested just worked with the base Proton 7 or with Proton GE. It can even access the SD card if you use flat seal to give it permission to do so. So now you can play all your epic games on the Steam Deck that you definitely already have, right? No one's been pushed to after Q3, that would be too cruel. Just like it would be very cruel to insist on the fact that some people got pushed to Q3. Speaking about the Steam Deck, still, it can now run Windows, thanks to drivers that Valve dropped. These drivers are only for Windows 10 for now, as TPM support isn't ready in the firmware just yet. And these drivers don't include any audio, so you won't get any sound from the audio jack or from the speakers. 
And on top of that, the first test seemed to show that Windows on the deck, as predicted, is a way worse experience than using SteamOS. Performance is bad, the OS is not easy to navigate at all, battery life is generally worse than on SteamOS, you don't get the new SteamOS interface yet, and you can't dual boot either, so you have to erase your whole system. And more importantly, Valve said that they would not support Windows on the Steam Deck, so don't expect continually updated drivers to support the hardware better and better or to improve compatibility with certain games. It's probably more of a release it once and forget it type of situation. But since the Steam Deck is so popular, every studio out there is outlining their policy towards it, or their lack thereof. Xbox Studios, for example, gave a non-committal answer, saying that each studio under their umbrella is free to publish games on Steam with or without Proton support for anti-cheat, and that there is basically no global directive. As of now, a few of their titles are verified, like Deathloop, Hellblade, or The Evil Within. Some are playable, like Sea of Thieves and Forza Horizon 5, and some are unsupported due to anti-cheat, like Gears 5 or Halo Infinite. Come on Xbox Studios, check those checkboxes, ship those .so library files, and let us get some multiplayer Halo on the Steam Deck. Now, speaking of game compatibility though, we now have Apex Legends running on the Steam Deck, as mentioned last time. Because the developers quietly added that small library that they needed to make the game run, they checked the checkbox for the anti-cheat, and the game had been fully playable on deck and on Linux for a few days. Except that apparently that file wasn't correctly added to the game because it was also quietly removed a few days ago, which made the game unplayable for a few hours until the developers finally put it back where it belongs in a new update. And this outlines a few issues with the Steam Deck verified program. Even while the game was unplayable, it was still marked as certified, which means that developers have the ability to break a game, as with any other platform, but Valve doesn't really have the bandwidth to ensure that their ratings stay up to date. It's going to take a while before that certified seal of approval actually means that the game is fully playable and runs perfectly well, because right now, it doesn't. Fortunately, we're still going to get a lot more games soon on the deck, thanks to Valve because they decided to gift a Steam Deck to the Lutris developers. Lutris is basically the everything runner for Linux, thanks to many, many community install scripts, and thanks to very good integration with the Epic Game Store, Origin, GOG, Humble Bundle, or Ubisoft Connect. It's on Flathub, so it can be run on the deck, but it's a beta, and it lacks a lot of things that make Lutris great. So this Steam Deck will definitely help developers make Lutris a first-class citizen, that uses the DEX controls to be navigated and maybe works 100% on Flatpak. Now Valve's mastery and understanding of the various tools needed to make Linux a really viable gaming platform is still astonishing to me. I think we have a real ally there and, dare I say it, maybe it's not just another giant corp here to get some money. Nah, maybe not, that's probably going to come back and bite me in the deck. Still, we do have more than 1300 certified and playable games now on the deck, so it's not like we'll be lacking options on what to play. Newly added titles include Hitman 2, Orcs Must Die, Layers of Fear 2, Max Payne 2, or Super Hexagon. That's 25 to 40 games added daily to the list, which is still not enough at all to validate the whole Steam catalog in less than 5 years. On top of that, 80% of the certified titles are relatively recent, dating from 2015 and onwards. No one will be surprised by that, as of course Valve would prioritize games that are more recent and that have more appeal to gamers. These titles are also more likely to get an update from the developer to work well on the deck. And I know that for some of you kids, 2015 isn't really recent, it's retro gaming. But I grew up with the Mega Drive or Genesis for you Americans out there, and for me, anything younger than the PS2 is not retro gaming and it's relatively recent. So I might be super old or you might be super young, but every Simpsons fan knows that it's always the kids that are wrong. And we can't finish one of these videos without an update to Wine. Wine 7.4 was released, enabling the new light theme by default. It also bundles VKD3D out of the box so it can run DirectX 12 titles, and it converted Wine D3D, D3D12, and DXGI to the PE executable format, so games should work better. There are also 14 bug fixes, including for enabling vibration in the DualSense controller, 
or for games like PsyOps, League of Legends or The Godfather. Now I don't know if seeing less and less bug fixes each release for specific titles is a good thing or not, but I personally choose to think it means that less and less titles need game specific tweaks and that it's a good thing. Just like today's sponsor is a good thing if you need a new Linux laptop or desktop. Slimbook makes both of these from Valencia, Spain, but they ship worldwide and they have all keyboard layouts and devices for every price point. For example, the Slimbook 1 is a small form factor PC with powerful Ryzen CPUs, good integrated graphics and a really nice upgradable aluminum enclosure. You can check it out in the link in the description below, I already reviewed it on the channel. It's a fantastic small form factor PC and honestly, if you need a small thing, that's really the one you should get. So thanks everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to, to write a comment, to give me money, do everything you need to make those videos keep coming. You can join my Patreon subscribers, you can join my YouTube members, you get access to my weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. And if you dislike the video, well, give it a dislike, tell me why in the comments, it also works. In the meantime, thank you guys for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it and I guess I'll see you in the next one. Bye.